if that didn't wake you up, ooh, something's wrong. And I want to tell you something I'm very, very excited about. We have started something new today. Can anybody tell me what that might be? Woo! Yes! <laughs> yes, we have started a praise choir. And we just, we talked about doing it sometime, having a kickoff sometime in September, which we're going to do. But yesterday we said, pastors, we had a meeting. We said, you know what? We just need to do an impromptu praise right. choir, call people that we know had expressed an interest. So if you are interested, next Sunday at 830, come join us. We rehearse. And we want to fill that whole section as a praise choir. It'll be awesome. Too much fun. I love it. Well, how many of you did come today expecting to receive something? Okay. You need to because God's been showing up every week. That's right. And if you haven't been here, you've been missing out. But we're glad you're here today. And how many of you need some victory in your life? How many of you need some healing? Okay, we're here to declare God's glory. We're here to declare God's healing. We're here to declare God's victory. So you might as well join with us because you're going to get it. Okay, let's do this together. Today. I 
am so excited about what God is doing in this church. Are you? Yeah. Ooh, I tell you, I love it that God has just broken down those walls that we built up. Because he didn't bring it. He didn't build those walls. We built those walls. And God says, I don't want that. And I especially don't want it in my church. I mean, there ain't no place. Church is no place to build up a wall between you and God. But how many of you, be honest, we do that, don't we? We do. We let, let the things of life help us build those walls up between us and God. And God's like, hey, stop it. Stop it. I want to be with you constantly. He says, I am faithful. Let me ask you this. How many of you in the, oh, let me just say in your whole life, how many of you ever had something that the enemy has stolen from you? Uh -uh. Only five? Okay, we've all had something the enemy has stolen from us. But God's word says that he will give back how much? Seven times what the enemy has stolen from you. That's not a bad, that's not a bad return. Okay, that's a stock you can pretty much take to the bank. He promises, I will give you back seven times what the enemy has taken from you. And God is faithful. Is faithful. We're going to sing this song about taking back what the devil stole from me. I want you to sing it from way down deep inside because I know you need to see God move like that. If you don't need to see God move, just sit down and be quiet. I mean, honestly, don't sing, don't worship if you don't want to see God move. But if you really want to see God move in your life, Sing it out with all that you have. Sing it out as strong as you can sing it. We're going to take back what the devil stole from us. Today, right now, we're going to take it back because God is faithful. God is faithful. You hear me? I hear you. Faithful.
Let's pray. God, we worship you. And we thank you. We thank you for your promises because, God, we know that anything else in this world, we can count on you. When we can't count on our jobs, our families, even our friends, we know that we can count on you all the time, every day, all day. So, Holy Spirit, we welcome you into this place. We ask that you rain down on us something fresh for every one of us today. Touch our lives. Touch our church. We want all of you. We don't want you just on Sunday morning. We want you every moment of every day of every week of every year for the rest of our life. We invite you in. Holy Spirit, rain down, rain down, oh comforter and friend, how we need your touch again. In 
says I see your heart and I see your desire to know me more than you've ever known me I also see your pain I know what you deal with I know what you struggle with and he says I have made a way for you trust me trust me There are people here today that need a rescue. You need a rescue. And you don't know what to do about it. I'm not sure who you are. But I know that you're here. That you're dealing with things that's too hard. And you need someone to rescue you. not asking anybody to share your story about what you're dealing with but I do want to do this if you know somebody that needs rescuing or if you yourself need rescuing and you don't mind we're going to open this altar up for you to come down and pray because God says I want to supply that rescue for you 
just ask me. And if you need one of us to pray with you, we'll be glad to do that. If you just want to come down here and get on your knees and pray, maybe you're praying for somebody that you know needs rescue. I want us to take time now for you to come down and let's pray. As the band plays this song, just close your eyes, bow your heads. If you need to come down, the altar is open and we'd love to pray with you. needs prayer we're plenty of room down here we got time to pray we want to make sure we stand with you on whatever you're dealing with
This world has nothing for me. I will follow you. This world has nothing for me. I will follow you. This world has nothing for me. I will follow you. This world has nothing feel that you came today to Dallas because of a job or to be near family or to be near friends or to start a new life but the Lord says he destined this day for you that he has spoken to the nations and he's called you here to this place today because he wants to plant you in a new place for a new season for such a time as this there's more to come there's an influx of people coming they're coming they're coming and we've got to prepare the place for these folks because they have such needs but he's gathering together a group of people that's going to do a great and a mighty thing so don't take it lightly that you're here today. What the Spirit of the Lord was speaking to me about was that, you know, there's a lot of people in our community that have really never experienced what real love is all about. You know, they've tried to fill that void, that gap, with all different kinds of things. But he wants you to know that he loves you with an un unending love. And you might try to find that and seek that out, but he says, you know, the only place you can find that is me. And when you reach out to him, you know, it says, if we will seek him, we will find him. He is not going to hide himself. He's not going to find himself hiding away from you, trying to taunt you. He makes himself very plain as the person next to you. So don't leave thinking nobody loves me because there are a group of people here that love you with an unending love because we are a 
representation, a representation of who Jesus is on this earth. That's what we're supposed to be. So Heavenly Father, we're here today to embrace every person. No matter where they came from, no matter where the roots are. Father, we all have a destination, and that's with you. Our joint understanding is that you love us, and that, Father God, that you are drawing all to you. So, Father, we're here today to say that we're the early starts of many more to come. And, Father, we are here because we want to be used by you to touch this nation, this nation with the love of God. They need it so desperately. Father, let us embrace them afresh and anew today. And Father, we give you the praise and the glory for it in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. And everyone here said, amen and amen and amen. I want you to stand up just for a moment. And I want you to take a moment and I want you to greet that person on the right and on the left. We've got some new folks here today. Give them a big squeeze around the neck and share the love of God up and down the road this morning. you're here today. I tell you, we are very glad you're here today. Isn't God here today? I tell you, he's here. He showed up. He showed up. He said wherever two or three would gather in his name, there he'd be right in our midst, and he's here. I tell you, if, if you're missing the beginning of the praise and worship, you're missing a whole lot of stuff, folks. You're missing the entry into the throne room of God, and I tell you, we're, we're blessed, blessed, blessed. We've got more talent in this small work than a lot of the bigger churches do in town. And I tell you, we're blessed and more and more are coming, and I'm excited about that. I'm excited about that. Let me ask you a question. Why do we give to God? Because He gave to us first. What else? It's a sacrifice of ourselves. What else? The, Bi the Bible says to? Vanessa, where does the Bible say to give? Tithing? Giving is an expression of worship. Is God worthy? God is worthy, isn't he? I want to share something with you. I've been at some tables, I'm not going to say with who, but they leave bigger tips for a waiter than they have ever given to God. And I find that amazing. When we ask so much from God, and he serves us so well and unending is his love for us that we don't take care of him better and show him our love and gratitude more often david's got a testimony david why don't you come up here real quick i'll tell you something people if you will listen to the word of god if you will listen and you will put it into action you'll have similar results david tell us what happened Praise the Lord, everybody. It's good to be here this morning, and I just wanted to uh, let you know that God's doing a wonderful thing in my life. He's brought me to Dallas and has given me a, a church that is, uh, has welcomed me with so much love, and I just really feel that this is where God wants me. And um, I, uh, I'm an insurance adjuster, and I work at Liberty Mutual, and, um, you know, I was, had a lot of concern with moving here, and the biggest part was finding a church and, and giving back to God how much he's blessed me. 
And uh, last Thursday, I went and decided that the first thing I need to do is start giving tithes back to God because he's been blessing me. And it was minutes after I wrote out uh, my money order for tithes that I got a call because of the hurricane that's coming in. They gave us a uh, temporary $20 an hour raise. And so praise God. And, uh, you know, it's just so amazing to see that when you think that God isn't going to be there for you, I know it's temporary, but God is doing so much in my life right now with the people that he's bringing in and the blessings that he's given me. And I want to take that responsibility and do what I need to do and, and give back to God, not only monetarily, but with my heart and with my service. And uh, I just love the Lord today. Amen. Thank you, David. God had already answered. God had already set it up because he saw David's heart. You know, if you're willing to do it, if Gina, isn't that the truth? If you're willing just to, just to try him, the Bible says try him, test him, prove him, and see if he will not open you the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. I want us to pray and I want us to thank the Lord that you know what he does provide all of our needs he does he does Heavenly Father right now we just thank you that we agree with your word that says that if we give you will cause men and women to give it back to us good measure pressed down shaken together and running all over the place so Heavenly Father as we give today we give in Jesus name expecting a harvest a return and everyone said amen and amen and amen if you need an offering envelope raise your hand real quick if you did not get one if you did not get one and if you're making out a check this morning make it out to crossroads this morning god bless you as you give i tell you uh and we are going to receive a second offering so ushers you didn't know that and i didn't know that till just at this moment so uh just kind of hang with me here just for a moment let's receive this one and then we're going to take up a special offering here in just a moment you know oftentimes in a, in a church family as we grow needs happen and they're not planned and they're not things that we can prepare for and uh, uh, our minister of uh, worship arts Johnny head has a sister in Phoenix who had a heart attack one week ago today and she has and for all technical purposes has not survived that she has been declared uh, brain dead this morning or I guess Friday and uh, Johnny and Todd are preparing tomorrow to go to Phoenix they, uh, Johnny is the the person who has to make all the final decisions and he and Todd another one of our pastors will be going tomorrow to Phoenix to take care of all of the physical arrangements and the things that need to be done uh, she only has one son and they've been estranged for a number of years so there's a lot of mending that has to be done and we want them to go and not be worried about all the finances that they need on the way. So uh, I, I'm going to ask you to help support them in, in a difficult time that is not convenient. It's, you know, they're taking time away from their jobs. And I tell you, both of them have jobs with the city. And uh, it's not convenient for them to take off because they've got to come back to a lot of work. Uh, the city of Dallas has uh, cut personnel and slammed everybody else with more work and so Todd especially needs our prayer as they go so uh, I want you to stretch your arms out to Johnny and Todd just for a moment is and let's just send them our protection and prayers and we want to bless them to take care of them financially so Heavenly Father right now Father we know that this time is not easy it's not convenient it's not something that we certainly planned on but Heavenly Father we know that because of Johnny's testimony, she got into a church and she got born again. So, Father, the good news is that we rejoice with her. She's already there. But, Heavenly Father, we, we know that you've got certain works that need to be done. And, Father, we thank you for empowering them with your spirit. We encircle them with our prayer. And, Father, we know that they're going to go with your protection. The angels are going to watch over them as they drive and as they return. Father, so we want to support them in this mission. That, Father, as they go, they don't need to be worried about finances. They don't need to be worried about that. So, Heavenly Father, we want to make sure that they're covered. So, Heavenly Father, I ask that you speak to all of our hearts. This is something that we certainly wouldn't want to do. But, Heavenly Father, we can help make it easier for them. So, in Jesus' name, 
we support them with our prayer and with our giving now in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen and amen. If you want to do that, uh, ushers, if you've got an envelope, everything in this offering will go towards them. Uh, you just make it out to Crossroads. Everything that goes here will be, of course, credited to your tithe record. So if you want to give, that's certainly, this is an offering, considered an offering. So uh, please, if you need that to help them, that is a good thing. It's a good thing. I tell you, one thing that we couldn't do is without Missy. Could not do without this girl right here. She is here long before us. She and Mark Gadsden have been here uh, hours and Benny before us and got here to help set up. And I want to tell you something. Our church is growing. How many of you can tell that? And my projection is that we'll be full by the end of this year. So if you're used to getting here early, come on. If you're used to here getting here late, I'm sorry. You may not have a seat, and I will not apologize for it. <laughs> so if you want to get here and have to sit on the floor, we'll make room for you on the floor. But uh, that's what we're expecting. So I tell you, we're going to need your help as we grow. First and foremost, I want to thank you for praying for Mark and I while we were away on our vacation. We had a great time. Uh, some of the pictures have been posted to Facebook. If you're not a friend of mine, go ahead and it's just Robert H. Barker or you can go to the work church website and uh, get me through there. But uh, we're going to post a bunch of the pictures from this week's vacation. Last week we were gone in California and had a great time. A couple of our friends went with us. But I want to thank you for praying for us and allowing us the time away. Uh, I really do appreciate that. Uh, Last Sunday, there was such a move of God in this place. How many of you were here? I felt it all the way over in California. I got glowing reports of how God moved. And at the end of the service, we needed some help tearing down. And you all came to a wonderful aid. And uh, I'll tell you, we need that kind of support from you each and every week. So I'll tell you something. It's not hard rolling up a cord. It's not really hard. It's not like you can break it. So if you'd like to help us tear down at the end of the day on Sundays, this would be like a regular thing. You're here, you're kind of helping, just tear, uh, being on part of the tech crew, tearing down at the end of the day. Would you see Pastor Johnny at the end of the service today? Just give him your name, because we're just trying to make sure that we get everything done better as we go forward. Uh, I guess all of our children are already, no, our children are not gone yet. Where are Stephanie and Jessica? Right here. Stephanie, come here. Stephanie had a vision for our children. And I tell you, that vision is alive and doing well within this young lady. She's in her third year of medical school, fourth year, excuse me. <laughs> Correct me, girl. Correct me. She's going to one of the hardest schools and the best schools in the country, and that's right here in Dallas Southwestern. And I tell you, it doesn't take but just a lot of brain to be able to get into that place. So there's a lot packed into a very small spot. So, and uh, I want to tell you something. Your children are blessed when they're with her. They're blessed when they're in our children's ministry. So I want to tell you something. If you want to be a part of that blessing, they need some help. They need some help. We've already got all the curriculum. You don't have to do a whole lot. You don't have to do a lot of planning. All you have to do is turn the DVD on and get the lesson plan off of that. It's already done for you. So if you would like to help her and help our children grow up in a church that knows that everyone is loved, then please see Stephanie or Jessica at the end of the service today. They'll be out with your kiddos out in the main lobby to let you have them quickly after the service, okay? So let's let our children go. If you've got your kiddos with you today, let them slip out real quick. And I tell you, this is one of my favorite little guys right here, right here, right here. And we're going to let our kids go, and we're going to let our, our youth go. So if you've got kids that are fifth grade or younger, you go with the little people. And if you got over that today, you're going with Benny and uh, Brittany over here. And I guess Oscar's going to go help. George, glad you have you back. George had to go visit his boyfriend. Adam, and then Adam's been down here. We're, we're, I'm, 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 I'm glad. Uh, behind the camera, up here and over here, Mark and uh, Alex Voss. I mean, 
there are very few churches that have an Emmy award-winning camera guy. I mean, there are not very many churches that have that. And, and somebody that he's trained that knows what's going on here. And I tell you, our YouTube site is expanding. It's growing and we're getting lots of hits. And what I want to tell you is you can help that grow by friending Facebook and then going to Crossroad, Crossroads CCUS. It's the website with no dot in there. Crossroads CC dot, uh, Crossroads CCUS. Go and like that. Go in and just like it. Then everybody, when we post something, will be able to see it as well. It's a good thing. God's really moving. And Ashton right up here has got the number one spot on our, on the hit list up there. His solo that he did here a few months ago got almost a thousand hits. That's, that, I'm Pastor Bob's going to talk to you later about that. Okay. When you upstage the pastor, you get in trouble. No. Not really. Open your Bibles, if you will, to Mark chapter 6. But I want you to make sure you thank Mark over here on a camera and Alex. They come faithfully every week. And I tell you, we are outreach. Yep. Give them a hand clap. They come faithfully every week and set up and record. And uh, all the messages are getting lots of hits, too. And that means that our ministry is going beyond these walls. And that's a good thing. We've got people literally across the United States that watch this every week. So it's a good thing, and I appreciate them doing that. Are you in Mark chapter 6? I've been talking about going crazy here. How many of you have been with me since I've been going insane the last few weeks? List, missed last week, but the, last, the three before that, we talked about going crazy all different kinds of ways. And today we're going to be talking about Mr. and Miss Fantastic. How many of you believe you're pretty fantastic? Can I see your hands? I mean, really, when you really think about it, how many of you really think you're pretty fantastic? I know Keith is. Keith just got back from three weeks in Japan. Sorry. <laughs> had all of his expenses paid. Sorry again. But, you know, somebody had to go, and it might, have been, might as well have been Keith. Well, we're going to read a story today about something that is really pretty fantastic. And I want you to... I was really kind of concerned because Shaw got really close to my message this morning. She got really close to it. But I'm so thankful that she took a, a little different turn on part of the scripture this morning. Shaw's going to be speaking again next Sunday morning. And I tell you, if you miss it, you're going to be missing it. She did a glorious job today. Glorious job today. Mark 6, we're going to start reading verses 1 through 6. I'm reading from the Message Bible today. He left there, this is Jesus, and returned to his hometown. This is where I thought she was going to get into my stuff this morning because she was, he was back in Nazareth again. His disciples came along. On the Sabbath, he gave a lecture in the meeting place. He made a real hit, impressing everyone. We had no idea he was this good, they said. How did he get so wise all of a sudden? Get such ability. But with the very next breath, they were cutting him down. Oh, he's just a carpenter, Mary's boy. We've known him since he was a kid. We know his brothers, James, Justice, Jude, and Simon, and his sisters. Who does he think he is? They ripped over that little that they knew about him and fell sprawling, and they never got any further. Jesus told them, a prophet has little honor in his hometown, among his relatives, on the streets he played as a child. Jesus wasn't able to do much of anything there. He laid hands on a few sick people and healed them, and that's all. He couldn't get over their stubbornness. He left and made a circuit of other villages teaching. I tell you, that makes me cry. Because I would hate to think that Jesus would show up here and we would belittle him with how little we thought he was capable of doing because he was just a man. Wow. I don't know. Uh, how many of you got my email on fan, the Fantastics this week? Well, how many of you read the, com the comic, The Fantastics? It's really about four different people. 
One of them is a guy by the name of Reed Richards. He is Mr. Fantastic in the fact that he had this brilliant mind able to solve any problems. He was able to stretch his body like silly putty. And then he had uh, her, his heartthrob, Sa, uh, Sue, who was the invisible woman. I'm not gonna go there. Thinking about a few wives that I've had, no, just one. <laughs> Completely disappeared when needed. That's what she was capable of doing. She's also capable of projecting force fields that protected her and others. Then her brother, whose name was Johnny, he was the human torch. Remember that? The human torch, he was able to start a fire just by flicking his fingers. Uh, he also was known for his really good looks that he could even with his wink, he could start a fire. That's my true example of a flamer. Anyway, uh, <laughs> the, the fourth of this crew is, was Big Grim. He was known as The Thing. There have been movies made about him and the fact that he really had a very soft heart, but he had this imperviable outside very tough outside and was always, you know, in, had phenomenal strength in the fact that every time he was down, he would just simply get back up again and never take him down and he'd get back up again. And these four were really the Fantastics. And I think about that and I think, you know, how many people in our community are just like that? You really are fantastic, you know. I got news for you. When you think about that, how many of you have ever stretched your mind, your physical resources to incredibly elastic links to meet the needs of others? How many of you have really gone beyond? How many of you have really done that? Let me see your hands. You've really gone beyond to help somebody else. I know Vanessa has. I know, I know Penny has. George has. I know lots of times we have gone to great lengths to help other people. That's okay. Uh, Maybe you've even covered your own needs, made them invisible to yourself and to others so that you could take care of other people. You took care of others when, when you yourself had a need. Sounds good. Some of you even protected other people from situations because you had the ability and the power to do that. Maybe you tried to save the world with your blazing energy, your charm, your speed. You're rarely worried about whether or not you'll burn out because you're tough enough that you can just continue to go on. You can do it. You can stretch, you can do it. And we do. You, maybe you're the strong one that every time you get beat up, pushed down, you get back up again because you're phenomenal. And my question to you is, does any of this resonate with you? that you have done the fantastic oftentimes at your own expense. So let me ask you a question. Where does the drive to be that fantastic come from? And this is going to hurt because I'll tell you, when I began to examine this, I had to do some real heartfelt thinking about, about me and my past. Where does that drive to go beyond the natural come from? Over in Luke chapter 12, verse 48, and I'm just going to read it for you. It says, from everyone who has been given much, much will be demanded. And from the one who has been entrusted with much, much more will be asked. So, you know, part of me thinks that, you know what? It would be amiss if we didn't do everything that we could possibly do with God, what God has given us. Every talent, every gift that we have, we would be remiss if we didn't do with that which God had given us. So we take that and we stretch it and stretch it and stretch it. Because after all, God's asking more from us, isn't he? We'd like to think that to kind of justify the way we do things. But I want to tell you something. There are two things that I want you to think about, about being fantastic today. First, it's fine to pursue the fantastic life. It's great. I want you to do that if you've taken the time to discern what is driving you. 
because there's only going to be two sources that are going to drive you to that drive to be fantastic. Sometimes we feel this desire to heroically stretch or to surrender our own visible needs because of the deep needs around us than because of the disordered needs within us. So there is a struggle that's going on in the inside about being fantastic. There's one of two things. And Shaw got a little of it this morning. She got real close when she was talking about this. And what I'll tell you is that probably many of you are more healthier than I am. Where this is regarding. Because I've had to confront some very painful things about myself. One is I had a, a, a change in my thinking about two different ways of why in my life I've had to be that Mr. Fantastic. One is the desire to be faithful with the gifts God has given me and I want to hear when I die, when I see him, I want to hear those few words, well done, thou good and faithful servant. I, I really do want to hear that. And on the other side of me, this is that crazy side, that I love to hear the desire of people when they say, oh, Pastor Bob, you're wonderful. You're doing such a great job. There's nobody like you. You have done more to touch this community in the last 10 years than a lot of people. You're just fantastic. You're absolutely wonderful. That drives us to be fantastic because we like to hear those things. See, when I was growing up, I grew up in church and I've told you that story. Got saved when I was a very young boy. Well, when I was a preteen, probably 12 or probably maybe 13, my mom had invited a bunch of people from the church, a bunch of ladies coming over to the church and she was making a comment. She's going I'm have to pick up some stuff because I don't have anything for them to eat. And I said, mom, I said, I'll take care of that. She said, how are you gonna take care of that? Oh, we've got stuff here at the house, I'll, I'll put it together. Well, you know, I told you that I had a friend, Graham Kerr, the Gallup and Gourmet, that I watched when I was a kid. And I thought, well, I can whip up something together here in this kitchen. And I did. I had this great meal, laid it all out, placed napkins, china, the whole bit. My mom walked in and wanted to know who showed up. And I said, I did this. She said, no. I said, yeah, I did. She said, you're fantastic. My mother thinks I'm fantastic. So suddenly, that little drop of that fantastic joy that comes when people appreciate you began to come on the inside. And I thought, ooh, I like that. So I began to go about this process of doing things that were beyond my own ability because I wanted to hear that, you're fantastic. And I know a lot of us in this community have this kind of thing about perfectionism. We like being perfect because we think if we're perfect, then people can't see through that perfectionism to see that one thing that we're really trying to hide about us that we don't want people to see. At 19, I was given an opportunity to be a director of a performing group that won one of the highest accolades in the state of Texas. We competed about, against about 250 groups, and we became the state champions. At 20, I was asked to be one of the state clinicians for that particular choral group. I was one of the judges at all of the uh, regional and state tryouts for state competitions for this group. So at 20, I was doing things that people 40 years old were doing. I was sitting there next to these people who were older than me, and they said, wow, you have such a keen ear. You're fantastic. Yes, I am. <laughs> so here at 20, I'm going to school. I had already gotten a full tuition scholarship to Baylor, Hardin-Simmons, Wayland, OBU in Oklahoma. Turned them all down despite my parents saying, you're gonna go, you're gonna go, you're gonna go. And I took a job with a, with a school being just a little music student at ORU, Oral Roberts University in Tulsa, against my parents' better judgment, they let me go. 
because see when I did that I stepped outside the Baptist circle oh God and you just don't do that I was suddenly off the docket of everybody no one wanted to talk to me when I had sung every month on television there suddenly I was persona non grata no one liked me I come back and I think I'd be the same person oh no you're not because you're going to that school well while I was at that school I tried out Four World Action Singers, and that was, the, that was the, the group that sang on the program. Those of you that are as old as I am that remember that program, I was one of those guys that sang on the weekly show in front of 40 million people. There were only six guys, six gals, uh, about 3,500 students. So pretty soon, those six people were really sought out by everyone else because they wanted to know those six people because they were fantastic. We were on television every week in front of 40, 000, 40 million people. I actually showed Mark this last week, NBC Studios, where we went out flew out from Tulsa out to California and we did all the taping out there at NBC for all those all that time we spent 10 to 10 to 11 weeks out of 16 in California in television all the time we got to do television specials with Doc Severance and the Linden sisters I know that's longer than most of you have been alive but uh, all different kinds of people like Della Reese and things like that we got to be on with Roy Rogers and Dell Evans and now their stuff like Trigger so uh, all those kinds of things we got to be with that very elite group of people and suddenly you begin to hear all kinds of things about wow you're doing things that no one else is getting to do and I said that's right I am and not only did I learn about being in front of the camera, I learned about the backside of the camera. I learned about all the technical stuff. So that when I married, my wife's parents wanted to go on television. So we did. And in a matter of, oh, like six years, I had already produced 300 half hour programs with all these special people being on these programs, doing something at 22 that people 45 and 50 years old were just doing. And again, you hear that, you're thinking, how can you do that? And we were traveling and doing the television program. They wanted to go on radio. We put them on a national radio schedule. And I was doing all this, and I just, because I kept hearing that, wow, you're really special. You're really, you're, you're really something. And I believed them. Came up to Dallas and started with working with a little church. I mean, they only had about 120 people. I thought the pastor was really pretty good. And I said, you know, you think about going on television? He said, I'd like to help you. So uh, much like us to begin with, we only had one camera, Alex. Now we got two. We actually have two shots now, big time. Uh, back then we didn't, we only had one camera and we had the number one Nielsen rated program in its time slot with one camera. I shot the Sunday morning show like this and then the night we took a side camera shot and we did all the fills and we produced the number one Nielsen rated program people said how can you do that you must be fantastic at what you did when I started our, our, our other church in North Dallas I decided instead of being on the back side of all that I decided I wanted to be in the front of that and a guy came to me and says have you ever thought about being on the radio and I said no I really have never really thought about it I said, I've thought about producing and I've done a lot of production work, but I've never thought about actually being the person on the other side of that. And he said, I'd like you to think about that. So we put together a concept and we pitched it to, uh, the, at the time, the largest FM Christian station here in the Metroplex. And they said, yeah, we'd like to find a time slot for you. And I said, well, this is the kind of program that I want to do. I want to do a live call-in show. Nobody else is doing that here in the city at that time. And I said, I'd like to do that. And they found a time slot for me and for eight years, I never paid a penny for time. The station owner paid for my time. And the reason was because it wasn't because necessary people were calling into us because they were, but they were calling into him saying, where did you get that guy? He's fantastic. But being like every drug user, every person who's ever been on alcohol, they'll tell you, boy, that feels really good. Boy, doesn't it feel good? Ah, yes. You just want to tap a vein and go on. The problem is, at some point in time, there will be a price to pay for that. You, your body, and those people around you will pay a price for that. And the price is that there is a price for approval and everyone here in this room has sought after it. 
We either seek it from our parents, we seek it from our peers, from those people that we work with. We want them to give us that approval. And oftentimes there's that itch on the inside that we can never ever quite get to and we keep going after it. It's, I just need one more, you're fantastic. And we go beyond, 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 beyond. And soon we're stretching until there's very little of us left. We're good parents, we're good workers, we're good partners, we go to church, what more can we do? Well, we'll find something for you to do and we'll stretch that thing a little bit further and we'll do it, we'll do it. I did all of that having four children, a wife who loved money, who loved Neiman's, who loved Nordstrom's and had all of this, the trappings that went with it. And I had, I thought, every ball in the air juggling. And I kept thinking, somebody's gonna throw the kitchen sink in there and have all of this going. And I kept waiting for it. And every time they threw on something else, my in-laws would throw on something else, national stuff, international stuff, I kept taking on one more thing because I didn't want to give up that you're fantastic. There's a concept in Christian tradition. It actually started about the 8th or ninth century. And this tradition is, it says that the genuine spiritual health and transformation of an individual lies in ruthlessly naming and exposing to God's light the darkness of what theologians have called the false self. This is where you were kind of talking about this morning, the false self. The false self is that angry, anxious, and fearful voice within us that asks other human beings to establish for us our identity and our core worth. We want other people to do that for us because we're afraid that if we set the marker, we may set the marker too high and we may not be able to do it. So we allow other people to begin to give us that approval and we begin to rise up to it. And every time they say it, we want a little bit more. So we pump, 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 and we begin to take on more and more and more and more until we are fantastic out. It is the fearless yearning to have other human beings answer this question for us it is one of the demonic influences the Bible warns us about that can make our lives crazy. Hearing that from other people, hearing that from other people, hearing it from other people. However, we don't have to live this way because as sure as there is a false self, there is a what? True self. The true self does not seek approval from anyone. The true self has an understanding about one scripture, that if we'll receive the affirmation from God that he gave to our brother, Jesus. You see, you were talking, Shaw, this morning about the fact that we are him in physical form, just as Jesus was on this earth. We are him. So if we are Jesus on this earth, we should also have received the affirmation that he received. When Jesus was baptized, remember the story? Out of the clouds, the heavens opened and a voice came down and he said, you are my child whom I love. With you, I am well pleased. You need to hear your heavenly father saying that to you. You are my child. In you, I am well pleased. I love you. I love you. You need to hear the voice of God speaking that to you. When you do, you will not need the voice of anyone else saying you're fantastic because there's no higher voice than God. There's no more approval you need to have. There's no more expectation you need to think about yourself other than hearing, I'm loved by God. I don't have to listen or strive to get anything else from anyone else. I just want that to ring in my ears. I want that to resonate on the inside of me. I'm loved by God. I'm loved by God. I'm loved by God. Everybody say that. I'm loved by God. Say it again. I'm loved by God. Say it again. I'm loved by God. And you are. 
But the problem is you've allowed other people to establish your worth by the scale of fantastic in their eyes, whether it be a parent, a school teacher, someone in your youth, you've allowed them to put the cap on how fantastic you are when you know what? Take the cap off because God says he loves you just the way you are. You cannot get any better than being loved by God. You can't serve man to get any more worth than God has already paid a price for you. It's interesting, though, that how we'll do that. So let me ask you a question. How many of you are a child of God today? Then none of you should listen to that false voice. None of you. None of you should ever think of yourself as being less than anyone else. You shouldn't hear voices tell you you are going to hell and believe that. You should not believe that because they are not God. And God has already said, in you I am well pleased. Is he going to send a child that he loves to hell? No. Absolutely not. Well, how do we make sure that we don't get into that insanity? Two things. We're going to go back to Mark 6 in a moment. Two things. Jesus went an, under an identity test. And he went right here. How would you like to be the son of God, the miracle working, all powerful, almighty voice for God on the earth? You have done more miracles trailing you than any human being has ever seen, ever been a part of anything, ever heard. His life, the book of John says at the end, it says, if we recorded all the miracles that Jesus did while he's alive, there would not be libraries enough to hold all the volumes of all the books. So we just see in the Bible a fraction, minimal numbers of the dynamics of who Jesus was on this earth. So here is this fantastic of all fantastics coming into his hometown. Oh, he's just the carpenter's son. I saw him. I saw him running around with a dirty diaper one day. Golly. After all, you know, he went to school with my kids. He wasn't the brightest kid. Worked at his dad's carpenter shop. I mean, he didn't have a professional life. He just worked with his hands. What were they trying to do? Bring him down. There are going to be all different kinds of people who want to bring you down. They're going to try to tell you all things. They're going to try to tell you and try to convince you that that's the voice that you need to be listening to. It could be that inner voice, but that's that dark voice false self that we want to believe versus what the Bible says when God says, I love you. You have to change your mind. Kathy Kennedy's, one of our favorite scriptures is in Romans chapter 12. Have a transformed mind. Be ye transformed by the transformation of your mind. Why? Because we have to have a, an exchange for what we believe versus what does God believe about us. You've got to decide who is going to be the louder voice, that false voice or the true voice. So here's what we have. Jesus is coming to town here into Nazareth. Does he feel diminished when he is in there? When they've said all these things and he's heard that, you know, he's got great ears. Is he diminished? Is he put down? Is he, oh, this is what the people think about me. No, the Bible says he only feels sadness for the people's blindness of the gift in front of them. That's what you should feel when they don't accept you either. You shouldn't feel diminished because people think less of you. You should feel sad because they don't recognize the gift of God in front of them. And you need to act like, you know what? I am the gift of God. And that's not being boastful. It's not being proud. It's understanding that God says he loves you. He sent his son to die for you. That makes you a joint heir with Jesus. Everything that he has now, you already have. Right now, it'd be, it'd be interesting. It'd be interesting if someone died, not 
someone died, had a relative here, long lost relative that left you a gajillion dollars. I know how, I know how Shaw would spend it. Cat food. No. Uh, not all of it. She might buy another bib, I think. I think. If that person died and left you that money, if you didn't know it, you would never spend it. But the moment you had knowledge of that money, I guarantee you, you would be making a beeline for that place to get the money. Why aren't you at a beeline to get what God promises you here? He said that you are the head and not the tail. You are above and not beneath. That you should lend and not borrow. He has given you all kinds of good things that you need to understand about yourself instead of hearing that bad stuff. Oh, well, the reason why this hurricane came is because of all those gay-like people who get manicures and pedicures. God's a little confused about whether they're gay or not. I don't think the God that I serve has ever been confused in a moment. I don't think he can be confused. But I thought that was interesting out of the most professional television evangelists out there. Little does he know that he has just made a fool of himself by saying God's a little confused. You know what they do in the Old Testament about false prophets? I'd like just to pull the plug. That's all I'd like to do. Okay. You need to realize what God has said about you. Let me ask you something, though. See, Jesus had the disciples with him. And you know, the Bible says it goes on about chapter 6, chapter, about chapter verse 30. It says that the guys have gone out and they've gone to teach. The disciples have. Now, Jesus is kind of stuck around here and he's kind of sent them out and the Bible says that they went out and taught and the people were amazed they were amazed at what the lectures that they gave and the demonstrations that they proposed all of this and they came back and Jesus was they, he saw them all pumped <laughs> have you ever been pumped you know it's just like it's like David it's like getting that race boy did that pump you or what yeah, look, they think I'm worth an additional $20 an hour. Yes. Who wouldn't be pumped after that? And every right to be. But here's the point. These guys came in all pumped up. So there was still crowd pleasing going on even amongst the disciples. They felt all of the accolades and Jesus was seeing it happen to them. And it's easy to get sucked into that. So there's two things I want you to learn. The second thing is, I want you, there's actually three things I want you to learn from this experience. Jesus seeing them, Jesus not being saddened, but saddened for the people. First, Jesus accomplished things that were truly fantastic. He did. Things that no other human being has ever performed before because we haven't stepped up to the plate yet. See, if you're not casting out devils, then you haven't really stepped up to the plate, casting out devils. Yes, we're going to have a class, 101.3, casting out devils. If you're not healing the sick, you've really not stepped up to the plate yet. If you're not walking in the supernatural, you are walking on this earth just as a human did. But you are not human. You are superhuman. And the thing that I think about Jesus is that he did not fake all of the things that he did. It wasn't a green screen and superimposed through Steven Spielberg, all of these things that he did. It wasn't fake. It was real. And he did it. So there's not this hype that people think and put around people who are supernatural. There wasn't any. He walked this earth just like everybody else. He made his needs clear was the second thing. He proved himself to be a rock in the midst of bad situations. And the only thing that he did, he wasn't moved by what those people said. He was just saddened because they felt that way, that they couldn't see it. 
And how did he do that? Because he was regularly drawing on the strength of God through prayer. He was keeping himself balanced, always consistent. He was never up and never down. He was right on target every time. Third, when the crowd, when the crowd gathered around him and his disciples, Jesus reminded his disciples of their limits. And he said, you know what? <laughs> I see what's going on here. He said, so you know what we're going to do? You're going to come away with me to a quiet place where you can't hear anything else. You're going to come away with me where you can get some real peace and some real rest. He drew them away from all that they heard so that the only thing they could hear would be him. I like rest. And on this vacation, uh, the friends that went with us love going with us because they know that I'm going to book every moment of the day. They know that when they go with me, they're going to see everything in a glimpse. Then they'll have to slow-mo everything back so they can see it. Uh, they, went to, they went to Europe with me, and they said they've never seen, I mean, people have never seen as much stuff as I can cram in a day because I, I, I have a way with, with timelines. I have such a way with the timeline that I had planned a day where I knew that we couldn't do anything because there was nothing there to do. We went to Catalina. How many been? Is there anything to do there? No. <laughs> and here we, we get this beautiful, it's like Morocco. It's, no, it's like uh, Monaco, only in America. It's built, uh, Keith went with us once. We didn't find that same margarita, by the way. Anyway, or, or the woman that we saw. She wasn't there. That's another story. True story, wasn't it? That's a true story. Beautiful place, pristine. Get there. We go to the room. We're walking up and down the, the, the little street with all the little shops and the little places to eat and the, the oceans out there and the sun's going down over here. And my husband says, I'm bored. I say, excuse me, this is the day that we're going to do nothing. Oh, really? I said, yeah, this is the day we're going to rest. Reminded me of the last vacation I took with him. We were in Hawaii and had been there for quite a while and We'd seen lots of Hawaii because I'd been so many times and took him all around. And, and he said, you know what? You deserve to be able to rest. You know, you, you work hard. You, this is a time where you need to be able to rest. And he said, I just want you to slow down. I just want you to slow down. I said, okay. So I, I, I right there on Waikiki Beach, I threw out my, my beach towel and I, I laid back down and I took this beautiful, glorious picture of these palms above me, blue sky all around and I'd no more snap that shot. And he says, I'm bored, ready to go. <laughs> True story. That's not the kind of rest I'm talking about. The kind of rest I'm talking about takes more than just a snapshot of time or a couple of moments. That time away is so that you can put all of the other voices away so that you could hear from God your worth, your value, that he loves you, that he can build in you the approval that no one living can give you. He will convince you of how fantastic you are. But see, there are some of you here today that need that kind of rest. You need to put it all away. Shut it all down. Turn off the phones. Turn off the phones. You will still live. You may think that, you're, they're, that they are your umbilical cord to the living world, but it will be okay. Turn them off. Turn the TV off. Turn the computers off. Sit there and listen for the heartbeat of God on the inside of you and let him tell you how much 
He loves you. So in conclusion today, do you genuinely want a heroic life with God? Do you genuinely want that? Because if you do, here's the thing. I want you to find a solitary, silent place and examine what really drives your behavior. What really drives you? Are you listening for all of the accolades of people and what they tell you? And are you now trying to live up to their expectations, pushing higher and higher and higher, when in reality all you need to know is that God loves you? But what I'll tell you is that doing these things, separating yourself and pulling away, is not the stopper to the fantastic life. Those things are the secret to the fantastic life. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we don't want to hear the things of the world. We, we're just, we're tired. We're tired of all of the stuff that the world would have to say. Father, all we want to do is we want to make time for you. We want to separate ourselves. We want to be able to take a moment and say, Heavenly Father, just speak to us your heart. You said that you have given us all power all dominion, all authority. When we believe that, stop believing the lies that come from other people directed by the enemy. We will do the miracles that you said are ours. We'll perform the miracles that you said we would do. The greater things will we do because you've empowered us with the true self, the approval that comes from only on high. So Heavenly Father, right now, when we all repeated that I am a child of God, I am a child of God. God loves me. God approves me. Father, I pray that every person here that said that will believe it swallow it. Let it get down deep on the inside of them. Let it take root and let it produce a life of miracles. So Heavenly Father, we give you the praise and we give you the glory for today that every person here is truly fantastic because we're all loved by God. Heavenly Father, we give you the praise and all the glory for it in Jesus' name and everyone said amen and amen. Give the Lord a hand clap here today. Amen. Amen, amen. I tell you, you are blessed coming in and going out. Everything you put your hands to do will.